This is what Persia looked like when Cyrus inherited it from his father, Cambyses I, in 559 BC. And this is what it looked like at the end of his life in 530 BC. The fact that he started from almost nowhere in the beginning and then went on to become the founder of the Achaemenid Empire, the biggest empire the world had ever seen up to his time, is astounding. He was given the titles like the King of Kings, the King of the Four Corners of the World, and he is the only non-Jew ever to be called the Anointed One, in the Bible. He was well respected as a king during his reign and is well remembered even to this present day. His own nation, the Iranians, have regarded him as the father, the very title that had been used during the time of Cyrus himself by the many nations that he conquered, as Xenophon, a Greek military leader, and a historian writes. And those who were subject to him, he treated with esteem and regard, as if they were his own children, while his subjects themselves respected Cyrus as their father. The reason for this respect and reverence may very well have been his way of expansion and treatment of his subjects after he had conquered them. Cyrus the Great saw himself as a liberator of people and not a conqueror. As long as his subjects didn't revolt and paid their taxes, he treated them equally regardless of religion or ethnic background. He had no intention of imposing Persian religion, language, or culture on his new conquests. His style of government was based on respect for all the peoples over whom he reigned, and tolerance toward their customs and religions, setting him apart from earlier empire builders. When he was crowned a king of Anshan, he was little more than a tribal leader and a vassal king of the more powerful Median Empire to the north, against which Cyrus revolted and was finally successful in conquering the empire in 550 BC. The ruler on the throne of Media at the time Cyrus revolted, was none other than his own grandfather Astyages, father of his mother Mandane. Astyages was in fear of losing his empire to Cyrus, and his fear was based on the interpretation of the dream that he had seen. So when Cyrus was just a child, his grandfather Astyages had seen a dream one night, that the vines sprang forth from his daughter Mandane, and occupied all of Asia which included his own kingdom. The dream which eventually did come true when Cyrus the Great overthrew Astyages and conquered vast areas under his rule. Astyages upon fear of this dream, told one of his generals named Harpagus to kill his grandson, but Harpagus unable to kill the child, gave it over to one of the shepherds to get rid of the child, and the shepherd instead of getting rid of it, raised the child. A few years later, Astyages found out about the whole incident. But instead of killing the boy, he sends Cyrus back to his own homeland. Astyages cruelly punished Harpagus by killing Harpagus' only son and feeding him to Harpagus during a banquet. Cyrus the Great aware of this whole situation, made the best use of it. Harpagus wanted revenge, and Cyrus wanted to defeat Astyages. Herodotus wrote that Harpagus encouraged Cyrus to usurp power from King Astyages and convinced a large faction of Medians to defect to Cyrus's side, thereby ending the reign of the man who had murdered his son. Cyrus defeated Astyage's forces at the Battle of Pasargadi, and seized the capital of Ecbatana in 550 BC. The once subjugated Persians had become the conquerors. After the battle was won, Cyrus rather than seeking vengeance, demonstrated clemency and restraint, and spared the life of Astyage's. He treated him well, and kept him in his court as one of his counselors. In 547 BC, Croesus the king of Lydia, at the news of the sudden rise of Persia and the fall of his lifelong rivalry, decides to make use of the turmoil, and encouraged by the wrong interpretation of the oracle of Delphi, marched into Median territory. Prior to this incursion, he had sent a word to Delphi, asking for advice, on whether he should attack Persia. The Oracle of Delphi back in those times was the most important shrine in all of Greece, and in theory, all Greeks respected its independence. It was considered to be the Amphilas, the navel of the world. People came from all over Greece and beyond to have their questions about the future answered by Pathia, the priestess of Apollo. And her answers, usually cryptic, could determine the course of everything from when a farmer planted his seedlings to when an empire declared war. When the word returned from Delphi, 
The oracle suggested vaguely that if King Croesus crosses the Halys River, a great empire will be destroyed. Croesus assuming that the empire that would fall is the Persian Empire. So he led an attack against Persia. He began his campaign with an invasion of Cappadocia. He crossed the Halys River and captured Tyria. He sacked the city and enslaved all its inhabitants. Cyrus hearing this, advanced to halt this incursion of Lydians. Both armies met. But this proved to be an indecisive battle, with both the sides suffering heavy casualties by nightfall. Croesus retreated to Sardis the following morning. This was a pretty good move from Croesus, as he sought to stop the operation as it was already winter, and it gave him time to send requests for aids from his allies. But before his allies could arrive, Cyrus pushed the war into the Lydian territory and besieged Croesus in his capital Sardis. But at this point, Cyrus was heavily outnumbered, but the victory was achieved against heavy odds through Cyrus's calm resourcefulness, the discipline of his men, and the remarkable use of camels. He placed his camel at front of the line, and as expected, the strategy worked. As the army met, the Lydian horses fled at the strange sight and smell of the camels. Cyrus defeated and captured Croesus. Cyrus occupied the capital city at Sardis in 546 BC. This defeat of Croesus by Cyrus was a major step forward in the rise of the Persian Empire. After the battle was won, Cyrus spared Croesus's life and kept him as his advisor as told by Herodotus. But this account conflicts with contemporary Nabonidus Chronicles, which says that the king of Lydia was slain. Cyrus then returned and trusting a Lydian named Pactyas to send Croesus's treasury to Persia. However, soon after Cyrus returned, Pactyas hired mercenaries and caused an uprising in Sardis, revolting against the satrap of Lydia, Tabalus. Mazars, one of Cyrus's commander, was sent back to subdue the insurrection, but demanded that Pactyas be returned alive. Upon Mazars' arrival, Pactyas fled to Ionia, where he had hired mercenaries. Mazars marched his troops into the Greek country and captured the cities of Magnesia and Preen, where Pactyas was captured and sent back to Persia to be punished. Mazars continued the conquest, but soon died of some unknown causes during his campaign in Ionia. Cyrus sent Harpagus to complete Mazars' conquest. Harpagus captured Lycia, Sicilia, and Phoenicia, using the technique of building earthwork to breach the walls of the besieged cities a method unknown to the Greeks. He finally ended his conquest of the area in 542 BC and returned to Persia. Babylon was the next big city that he took under his rule. It so happened that Nabonidus, the king of Babylon was very unpopular at the time, and Babylonians were dissatisfied with his rule. Priests of Marduk, a national god of Babylon, opposed him as Nabonidus favored Sin, the moon god. Some even suggested that Nabonidus wished to completely replace Marduk with Sin as their national deity. Prior to the beginning of the war, he even brought the idols of gods from surrounding areas, threatening them that if they revolted against him and joined Cyrus, he would destroy the idols that he has brought out of their cities. In these circumstances, it was the best time for Cyrus to make a move against Nabonidus. In 539 BC, toward the end of September, Cyrus's army under the command of Gabaru, the governor of Gudium, attacked Opus on the Tigris and defeated the Babylonians after a minor uprising. And with this, the Persians took control of the vast canal system of Babylon. Next, the city of Sippar was seized without a battle, with little to no resistance from the local people. It's probably that Cyrus engaged in negotiations with Babylonian generals to obtain a compromise on their part and therefore avoid an armed confrontation. Nabonidus fled as he was in the city at the time, and went to his capital Babylon, which he had not visited in years. Two days later, Gabara's troops entered Babylon, again without any resistance from the Babylonian armies. Herodotus explains that the Persians diverted the Euphrates River into a canal so that the water level may be dropped, which allowed the invading forces to march directly through the riverbed to enter at night. The city was taken without much effort and Cyrus the Great himself entered the city of Babylon and arrested Nabonidus and assumed the title, King of Babylon. 
Before leaving Babylon, Cyrus made a declaration, which was written down on a cylinder, which was found among the ruins of Babylon, which has survived to this day. Cyrus sent back the idols which Nabonidus had brought from near the Babylonian frontiers. He worshipped Marduk in public in front of everyone and declared himself the one which Marduk himself has chosen. He freed the Israelites, which Nebuchadnezzar had brought from Judah, and even assisted in building the second temple in Jerusalem, which was previously destroyed. At this point he was more than just a conqueror, he was a liberator. He was freeing slaves, giving rights to everyone equally, freedom of culture and religion, putting things back where they belong. And these are the things that made Cyrus very popular, the most respected, most beloved conqueror of all time. He died around 530 BC, and very little is known about his death. There are various accounts of his death but they all contradict each other. Herodotus tells a story where he was killed by Tamaris, the queen of the Masagatai tribe, but Herodotus himself admits that this was one of the stories of the death of Cyrus, and that the truth is unclear. But there is one thing that is clear, and all historians agree on this, that Cyrus was in fact great, and that he started from this tiny region and the title king of Anshan, and at the end of his life, he had the greatest empire the world had ever seen. He had the respect of the people whom he ruled over, and a reputation of one of the most beloved rulers, who respected his people. Taking under his rule, people from different castes, colors, religions, and cultures, and not only conquering them, but also uniting them peacefully under a single empire. Almost everyone loved Cyrus, his nation called him the father, Jews the anointed ones, and Greeks the ideal ruler, an example to be followed. He was succeeded by his son Cambyses II, and his empire thrived in prosperity for 200 years after his death. This was overall the whole story of Cyrus the Great. So that's it for today, I hope you've enjoyed the video. And if you like this video, please don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe to our channel, and thanks for watching.